how would you describe your engagement with social platforms on the internet? Social media is broader than the apps you think of. This week, Chris Martin talks with me about how we can have healthy relationships with the content on the web and become more aware of how platforms control us. We talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what is coming in the future for the internet. The social performance runway goes everywhere with us now. There's no escaping from the social pressures. Chris's solution is not just to delete your accounts and log off. Instead, he has a thoughtful way of approaching technology that isn't going away. Bottom line, Chris says, use the platforms and don't let the platforms use you. Chris and I also talk about his new book, Terms of Service, The Real Cost of Social Media. You're listening to Life Repurposed, where you'll find practical biblical wisdom for everyday living, creative inspiration, and helpful resources. Grow your faith, improve your relationships, discover your purpose, and reach your goals with topics to encourage you to find hope amid the trashy stuff of life. Thanks for joining me today. I'm your host, Michelle Rayburn. Chris Martin is a content marketing editor at Moody Publishers and a social media marketing and communications consultant. He writes regularly in his Substack newsletter, Terms of Service, and his book with the same title came out from B&H Publishing in February of 2022. Chris lives outside Nashville with his wife Susie and their daughter Magnolia and their dog Rizzo. Here's my chat with Chris Martin. So I've tried to stalk you on Facebook. We're going to be talking about social media today, and you really do a great job of hiding out. So I wasn't able to dig up anything. However, in your bio, it says that your dog is named Rizzo. And I want to know, are you a Muppets fan or is there another connection? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it's it's funny that you have a hard time finding me on Facebook. I think that's, that is uh, somewhat intentional. I do, I do <laughs> hide out, uh, which we may get into some of that. However, I also share a name with the lead singer yes, of Coldplay, the which elephant no- in the notori- room. <laughs> yeah, notoriously makes me a little bit hard to find for good and for ill. I suppose for good when <laughs> when I don't want people finding me, and for ill when I'm trying to uh, launch a book. I suppose so. Um, but yeah, so we have our dog. Yes, his name is Rizzo. He's a golden doodle. Uh, it's hard to believe in February of 22 he will be five um <laughs> still still sometimes feels like a puppy but uh we so we are big muppets fans but he's technically named after anthony rizzo the former chicago cubs first baseman so we're big chicago cubs fans in our house and um anthony rizzo was a longtime first baseman for the chicago cubs led us to uh, our first world series in over 100 years and so uh so yeah we're big anthony rizzo fans here even though he had to depart for the New York Yankees this past <laughs> season. And uh, so it's, it's a shame we had to put the dog out to pasture. No, I'm kidding. We didn't actually do that. But um, but uh, so, yeah, but we are side note. We are big Muppets fans. So so I suppose that could be a sort of honorary reason for naming a the nice dog double Rizzo. connection. I, I'm That's ashamed right. to say that even though by name, my husband's family is all Cubs fans, I couldn't tell you that there was a connection to the Cubs, even though I know that there's a dog in the family named Wrigley for a very good reason. Sure. (laughs) So I understand. Anyway, I like to start with those little connections like that. I also am a Muppets fan, and my adult son and I love to go to the Muppets movies when they come out. So uh, Rizzo is one of my favorite characters. So we're going to be talking about social media today because that's what you've written about. And I want to know, what do you love about social media before I ask you what you hate about it? Sure. What I love about social media is I actually love a lot of things. So anyone who maybe happens to pick up the book that I've written on it, Terms of Service, may think that I hate it. I Well, they, when they pick it up, they may think that. My hope is after they read it, they don't think I do. Um, but I do, I do think there is a lot more to be a bit wary of than excited about. All of that said, I am, I, man, I love a lot. Uh, I love, uh, like my favorite social media platform of all time was Vine. Rest in peace, Vine. Um, Like that was a tremendous, like six second videos. I mean, there was just so much great comedy there. Oh man, (laughs) it was so, and and TikTok, like I'm kind of embarrassed to say, TikTok is one of my new favorite (laughs) 
social media platforms because it's kind of the spiritual successor to Vine. I mean, it's very different in a lot of ways, the musical component, et cetera, but it really embodies a lot of the Vine vibe. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I love social media for just coming across like people who I would never meet, who aren't professional comedians or entertainers, who are just really good at being funny or delivering the news in a compelling way. Like I follow a few YouTubers who deliver both like world news and like internet culture news about yeah. various creators or, or whatever and do it in just a really compelling way. Um, so I, I love social media for coming across people who are just super talented and and good at what they knew, what they do, but would never have maybe made it or, emerged through traditional media outlets like television news you know some of the folks i watch who deliver the news in a compelling way maybe would have never anchored the abc nightly news you know (laughs) and and i think it's the the internet has just been so wonderful at introducing each of us to people who have different sets of skills and Mm -hmm. talents to whom we maybe would have never been introduced had we not had the internet. So I think like on a big picture level, that is one of my, I mean, getting to do this with you, like without the internet, right. you know, uh, you know, you, you're not a radio host, which is like the traditional media right. version of a podcast. And so I love getting to be with radio folks, but being with podcast folks is similar, but different. And without social media and what I kind of more broadly call the social internet, we wouldn't have this opportunity. So I just have really loved, um, I really like using social media for things that maybe aren't quite as deep. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think one of the cautions that I often think about is this social media, it can be such a trivializing medium. It can make really important things seem really trivial um, because of the transient nature of content and the sort of like uh, numeric ranking of, of like what's valuable and what's not through likes and comments and shares that it can make really deep, really important topics seem less important than they are. But I think it can be really great. Social media can be really great for just introducing us to different forms of entertainment or different forms of social connection that while maybe aren't as deep and intimate as offline connection are still valuable regardless. Yeah, I've stayed connected to some family members that I would otherwise not have even known, you know, cousins that were born way after I was and and live in other states. I would never know them. But after reading your book, I did see that. Actually, I've skimmed your book just to be totally transparent. Sure, sure. (laughs) I want to read it when it comes out. So by the time this episode airs, the book will be out. And then I am definitely going to get the print version because um, it's the kind of book that I need to underline and mark and just really uh, dog ear the pages. So um, you do a great job of talking about the benefits of social media as well. So it's not all about hate, but I know there are some things you don't like about social media. So tell us about those. Oh man, Uh, this is very much a where do I begin kind of scenario. I would say the heart of the book and the heart of my concern with social media lies as much with us as it does with the platforms themselves. So I I am concerned about how a lot of the platforms work and I do not Mm -hmm. think social media is a neutral tool as many people call it. And I could maybe further in our discussion, get into why I just think that's not even just wrong. I think it's kind of foolish to treat social media like a neutral tool. Um, But I think a lot of my concern regarding our relationship with social media lies as much or more with the fact that we just so uncritically use it. Mm -hmm. We, we, we ask deeper questions and we, we put certain people or institutions or authority figures in our lives through the ringer of, of like trust and authority. Like, do I trust this person? Do I not? We put so many other people and and institutions in our lives through that kind of trust gauntlet in our minds Mm -hmm. at such, in such a more serious and, heartfelt way than we often do these platforms. Like, I just think we have too uncritically embraced social media. And that's the whole heart of of the book. And frankly, what I write about in my weekly newsletter and really just kind of the soapbox I stand on is that I never advocate for people to delete their social media accounts and say, it's just evil, log off. I mean, some people who are perhaps addicted to it and, and really find their identity in it, that may be a wise course of action. But I don't think I don't think just logging off and deleting accounts is necessarily wise. I think 
just intentional use is the right way to go about it is saying, what do I hope for social media to accomplish for me? Like, what am I looking for it to do? And so many of us just willingly entrust ourselves to these platforms or strangers on these platforms without asking some, I think, important questions like, why do I need to turn on my location services for Instagram? Like, do I really need to do that? Um, do I need to post, like I have friends on Facebook who have posted pictures of positive COVID tests, including their doctor's name and address and patient ID number. I mean, multiple people. I mean, this is not uncommon. I just think we're getting, I think we get a little bit too comfortable Mm -hmm. with these platforms. And I just think that as much as anything, as much as I nitpick Facebook and their horrible record on privacy or Twitter and their content moderation issues, all of those are worthy of discussion. I'm as much concerned about our inability to just think critically about Mm -hmm. these platforms and the way they're changing how we think about ourselves, the way they're changing how we uh, identify beauty in our, in our world. I, they're affecting how we think of other people as humans or perhaps less than human. And so I just think that we should have a more intentional, critical relationship with these platforms. And while they were promoted back, you know, I can remember when I was in high school and Facebook was made available to the masses, um, they were promoted as tools to connect us with friends and family or, or whatever. And that's all true. But my fear is, is that where we maybe started out using these platforms, really these platforms have started to use us. And that's really the core of my concern. And and I think a lot of that is just because we let something that was meant to be a, um, a facet of our lives become central to our lives. Yeah. So listener, I want to talk to you right now out there because you're listening in on this conversation. And if you're asking why is Chris on the show, it is because we cannot be like Jesus and be conformed to his line of thinking if we don't question our behaviors. And since social media is so much a part of our everyday life, it really affects how we live like Jesus and our behaviors on there don't always align with who we claim to follow. So that's a big part of the message of your book, Chris. I know that. So listener, as we keep talking, I want you to look for ways that you can be aware of changes you can make in your life. They may be massive or they may be tweaks. Now, Chris, you mentioned in your book that AOL Instant Messenger was your first, your gateway to social media. So was this on dial up? Oh, yes. 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 Yeah. So Think about how fast that has evolved, because on dial up, there was an action I had to take to get connected to the Internet. And now it's right here sitting next to me on my phone all the time. And when I was in school, it was like the social media actually was paper footballs, the little before origami kind of. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was social media. So over time, things have really changed. How do you differentiate between social media, the Internet and social Internet? you you have these terms tossed around in your book. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I really differentiate in the book between social media and the social internet. So to give a very brief history of the internet, uh, you have web two or web one, web two and web three. Web one is best understood as the internet as a billboard, if you will, where there were very few publishers on the internet. It was major news companies or or media companies were creating content on the internet. And you and I, as the user back in the early 1990s, anyone who's listening, who was maybe using the internet back then, certainly in dial-up era, we were just consuming content. We weren't creating content. Maybe we were sending emails. That's a that's about as much creating as we were doing was creating emails or, or posting on the earliest form of social media, like message boards and list serves and all of that. Um, that that's called web one, web 1.0. And that's really until like 1997, eight, like the end of the 1990s, it was around 1999 when we move into web 2.0 and, and AOL was a big part of that chat rooms, AOL instant messenger, those were really kind of the first big picture social media platforms. Then you get into Friendster, MySpace. Those are the more early iterations of our kind of modern social media platform. And so um, that's Web 2.0. And that's where we live right now. Mm-hmm. That that era has gone for a really long time. And that's where we're at right now is Web 2.0. Web 3.0, which we won't talk about much here today, but is really becoming more popular and talked about these days, is similar to Web 2.0. But instead of a few major companies seeming to control web 
2.0, like Facebook, Google being two of the biggest. Web 3.0, the whole point of that is to be very similar in function, all the same services, being able to buy things on the internet, socialize with people, but having more of the ownership monetarily, et cetera, be distributed among the users. So you could imagine a world in which um, you post something on Facebook and for every like you get, you earn a quarter. And for every comment you receive, you earn 50 cents. Like that web 3.0 will have those that there are actually social media platforms that already exist that do this kind of thing. So that's kind of what we can in part be looking forward to at the future of the internet. So the reason I differentiate between this social internet and social media is the social internet is the technology. The social media is the content we consume on that technology. So when I say social media, you likely think of a few app icons. Mm -hmm. Most people are going to think of Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat, Pinterest, YouTube, TikTok. I, throughout the book and really throughout my effort to kind of do ministry through writing and, and speaking on this topic is I want us to have a broader understanding of the internet to realize that really the whole internet is social. When you Google something like how, to what temperature do I cook chicken on the grill is it, is it 160 or 170 or when's it done you know that's one of the things like I, I i like to try to cook and and i'm like it's 165 right or am i thinking of something else um when you google that and you come and you get a response and something pops up a human created that response usually it's going to come up with like a, a blog post or an article like another person created that when you go to yelp and you look at reviews for a restaurant you go to go out on a date with your spouse over the weekend you go out you're, you're going to yelp to check out a restaurant review that's social that is social media but we don't think of it right. that way amazon book reviews that's social media but if i say social media you never think of those things True. and so what i what i really want to accomplish by trying to popularize i'm not the one who came up with the term social internet plenty of people have said that but what I'm trying to do by using that term much more frequently than social media is help us realize that our social experiences on the internet go far beyond what we do on those three or four apps that we think of. And we should really look at our entire relationship with the internet as social. And really this era that we're in, Web 2.0, is kind of understood as the social internet. I also think of, you know, another analogy, I guess you could say, is the social internet is like the table setting, the plate, the fork, the knife, the spoon as you sit down to dinner. Social media is the food mm -hmm. on the plate. It's what you it's what you consume. There's a great media ecologist um, named Neil Postman who really is one of the biggest influences on my on my life and writing and in this work that I'm trying to do. He wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. It's one of one of the most famous books on this topic. And uh, it was post, it was written in 1985, but it's as relevant today as it's ever been. And he, he talks about the difference between a technology and a medium. And that's really what I'm trying to convey mm -hmm. is a technology is the actual actual architecture, the sort of the sort of undergirding on top of which media is is constructed. Um, it's a sort of yeah, the, the technology is the foundation of the house and the, and the media is what's built on top of that foundation and, and how that technology is used. And so that's why I want us to realize that the actual technology, like the mathematics that go into the Facebook algorithm affect how you and I think much more than even the, the video we consume from that mm. algorithm, that that algorithm mm -hmm. has served us. Like the, the actual math, which I'm not a math guy. So if you're not a math guy or gal, trust me, I'm not either. But the, like the mathematical equations that are used to deliver us that content affect us just, just as much as that funny cat video we watch. And, and I just think we don't think about those things. And nope. I think we should think about them more. <laughs> That's true. We don't. I'm also a words person and not a math person. And it's the whole Internet is constructed that way. Because I do know from the years I worked at a marketing agency that we were thinking about uh, the fact that Google can track everything. And if I shopped for something on one place, the reminder showed up on Facebook and that kind of thing. And and I think it still surprises some people. But really, I, I'm not too shocked by the fact that every digital footprint is, that I have out there leads to something else. Uh, ironically, your book is called Terms of Service, something that most people don't read. <laughs> so I, I want people to <laughs> maybe read, like the book, depending. <laughs> I want people to read your book, but most people don't read the terms of service and know even what they're consenting to do. And that is something that, you know, it's like five pages long and we don't even know what we said yes to. 
That's right. And that's like, it's funny when I, when I was proposing this book uh, a couple years ago, I just put, it's like when you're, when you're proposing a book, it's like, you have to name the file something. <laughs> and so I just kind of named the file as a joke, the terms of service, because all of us lie about reading the terms of <laughs> nobody, like nobody except lawyers or privacy experts have ever read the terms of service to anything. And most people don't know that back when you signed up for iTunes back in 2007 or whatever, it said that you can't use iTunes to uh, create a nuclear nuclear weapon, you know, but it says that. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we don't read the terms of service and that is part of the joke. And, and also, I mean, part of the title is, is I think that you know, when, when we do explicitly click a, yes, I've read the terms of service, we're agreeing to a certain, a sort of contract of source, like we're agreeing to the terms mm -hmm. of the service of the platform. But I also think that we agree to a sort of invisible terms of service as well. We, we agree to a way that these platforms will have a hold on us that, that is never written anywhere in virtual ink. We never really have to lie about reading them because they don't exist, but there is a sort of like shadow spiritual terms of service, I think, or, or even mental and emotional that we're signing ourselves up for that we often don't think about. That leads really well into something you talk about in the book, and that is the kind of affirmation we get from online connections. So what's dangerous about that? Oh, man. I mean, the human desire to find identity and value in what other people think about us is not new. Uh, this is not a problem that social media created. And I'm careful to say that. Um, everybody wants to be popular. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be well, well liked. Um, that's been around since long before social media. Uh, but what social media has done is to use kind of a trope or a cliche, like it's really poured gasoline on that fire. And it's, quantified it in a very um, quantifiable way, in a very clearly understood way that you could maybe, you know, back in the 80s or if you were in high school in the 90s and um, you, you could you could get this feeling that people didn't like you or that you weren't as popular as other people. But today you like have the metrics to prove it. That's right. Um, and you, you have the you have the stats to show that people don't care about you as much as maybe you think they do. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody wants to feel significant. And I think part of what social media has done for good and for ill is it's given a lot of people the ability to find recognition and significance who maybe never would have without social media. And I, like, I'm not here to say that that's like bad or wrong that there are people who have gotten famous or rich or whatever, and I'm not here to dog them and, and tell, like, say that they're bad. But at the same time, what, what that sort of like social lottery, if you will, the sort of feeling that anybody can get rich and famous at any time with just the right funny viral video or, or picture or whatever, um, also creates this gap, this sort of feeling of deficiency that if, if I don't get recognized, if I don't get eight likes in the first five minutes of posting my Instagram, if I don't get certain comments or certain people responding to me, then I'm deficient in mm -hmm. some way. And I think any time, and like I said, this is not a new problem, but I do think that social media has made it worse, frankly. And, and it's, it's made it a lot easier to feel deficient if you try to find your worth and your identity in what other people think about you. Yeah. Um, and this just goes back to what I said earlier that I think so many of us have embraced these platforms so uncritically that they have come to define our worth in our minds without us even intending for them to do so. And a lot of us find ourselves feeling worthy, more or less worthy because of followers or engagement mm -hmm. of some variety. Um, and it's just because it's not that we set out to do that, right. um, but because of human nature and how these platforms are built, that's where we find ourselves. And a lot of us, I, I, I've, you know, I used to have a hard time getting people to talk about the negative sides of social media, <laughs> like a couple of years ago when I was first starting to have these conversations. Um, frankly, since the start of like COVID, like spring of 2020, summer of 2020, it's been a lot easier to have these conversations. Yeah. So 
I'm grateful. I don't know that it's because of the pandemic per se, but I think a lot of people have started to rely on those platforms more. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of people have started to see the cracks in our relationship with social media and the social internet broadly. And I think there's a little bit of light peeking through those cracks for us to maybe start asking, how can we have a healthier relationship with these platforms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've talked with my sons who are both high school teachers and in the eight to 10 years that they've been out of high school, they said they're observing a huge change in teenagers and this addictive factor of having the phone with them at all times and almost this panic of if I have to get off of a platform. I've seen people say they're going on a fast and they'll be off Facebook. Uh, See everyone, I'll be gone for 30 days. And then like that FOMO comes up because two days later they're posting again, like they couldn't even stay away for 30 days. Yeah, that's totally true. And and I think it's, um, what's interesting, you brought up, you know, high schoolers. I I help lead the student ministry at, at our church. And so I'm working with high schoolers and middle schoolers a lot. Um, and I think it's, the problem is definitely prevalent among them. And for many of them today, they, they've never known any different. Um, my hope is like a lot of people sometimes ask, like, you, what's your hope? Like, do you have any hope? <laughs> yeah, I have hope. Um, uh, I, first in Christ. But secondly, like I have hope that my hope is that this sounds bad, but I really think there is hope here that our current high schoolers and college students who grew up with this, right? Like they're I, I'm a digital native in the traditional sense of the term and that I was on AOL Instant Messenger was I, when I was in the f- first grade. But I'm not a digital native in the new sense of like I wasn't on Instagram when I was in eighth grade, which is like kind of a new digital native of sorts, like a digital native 2.0. Um, because, you know, I, there's a certain level of pressure that middle schoolers and high schoolers have today that even I, mm-hmm. who was on Facebook and Twitter in, in high school, did not have. Um, and that's because of the iPhone um, mm-hmm. and, or, or, you know, the rev- and everything that's come after, not the iPhone specifically. Um, but I think my hope is that these present Gen Z, call them Gen Z, I suppose, college and younger, bottom out so hard from their relationship with these platforms, like just really recognize the depravity of these platforms as as places to maintain healthy, intimate relationships that they can parent their eventual children Mm -hmm. in such a way that they sort of pendulum swing back and are asking very critical questions of these platforms that they, when they were in high school, the current high schoolers weren't smart enough to ask and that their parents having also been new to this Mm -hmm. whole game also were not smart enough to ask. Um, so my hope is that is that all of the difficulty that high schoolers and middle schoolers and high and college students are are experiencing today um, puts them through the ringer enough that maybe it can help improve their parenting in this way mm-hmm. whenever they become whenever they become parents. There's a great saying, um, Derek Thompson in his book Hit Makers uh, is who came up with this, and I think it's so helpful that high schoolers today. Um, you know, it, when you were in high school, when I was in high school, even though I was in high school with, with Facebook, um, you were in high school when we, way when you, after I was <laughs> sure, but you and I, but what's funny is like you and I had a much more similar experience than people who are in high school today. Um, even though you know, I'm closer to them perhaps in, in number of years, um, the, what's weird is like when you and I would go home from high school, um, socially we were safe. Like there, our, our house was socially safe. Like we could go home, do our homework, play in the neighborhood or, or hang out with our family. And we, we didn't feel like we had to perform until maybe a friend called us or we went to the basketball game or we went to the dance or, or whatever we could, we could retreat to the, what's called the backstage. Um, and when you think, and, and when you and I are in high school and it's still true today, the, the, the place of social performance is the hallway in between classes and the lunchroom. Um, You know, teens are performing. I mean, they're certainly performing in their classes as well, but socially that, that inter-class hallway 
experience, that social experience that are sort of like the hallway is the runway of sorts, like a social <laughs> runway where you're demonstrating your social prowess or whatever else. And Derek Thompson says in his book, Hitmakers, that today's teenagers are always in the hallway. Um, and to add my own language metaphor, they can never retreat to the backstage. Mm -hmm. They're always on stage under the spotlight. Um, if you ever, like, if there's any question about social media's effects on the mental health of teenagers, which there really shouldn't be, just imagine living your life like you and I. We can, you, you never get to leave the high school mm -hmm. hallway yeah. and the high school lunchroom. Imagine how socially debilitating that would yeah. be. When high schoolers today go home, they don't get to leave that social performance runway because they're constantly, they can choose to opt out, which is just really like forfeiting. Like you're just mm -hmm. saying, I don't want a social life if I don't want to perform on these platforms at any given time on any day outside of, even outside of the school walls. And so I think that, and really it's easy to dog high schoolers and, and adolescents, but, but their, their boomer and Gen X parents are doing this too. I was just thinking um, the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, frankly, I think a lot of high schoolers have a more healthy relationship with social media than their parents do. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> uh, but though they have their own issues, high schoolers, because they're so young and there's yeah. a certain immaturity yeah. there, obviously, um, I think that they're frankly more socially and internet savvy than their parents mm -hmm. are in a, in a lot of ways. Um, so anyway, that's a whole other discussion, but, but yeah, I, I think it is the whole seeking attention and affirmation is one of the most insidious parts of this whole, this whole relationship. This is a great place for me to tell you a little bit about today's episode sponsor, the life repurposed book. It includes stories of grace, hope, and restored faith from 34 women just like you. You'll find comfort, inspiration, and wisdom as they share their accounts of how they found hope and renewed faith as they've come through trials and tough times, including family struggles, infertility, health challenges, doubt, fear, human trafficking, depression, heartbreak, loss, and so much more. In these examples of forgiveness, starting over, renewed joy, fresh faith, and love and healing, discover inspiration to experience your own story of transformation. There are some thought-provoking questions to use for your own reflection or group discussion at the end of every chapter as well. If you'd like to know more about Life Repurposed, Stories of Grace, Hope, and Restored Faith, you'll find that at liferepurposedbook.com. That's liferepurposedbook.com. In terms of service, you really go into the history of the internet. You do a lot of research. It, this is not just Chris's opinion. This is supported by a lot of other people's input. And so that's really important because, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So if you're going to put a book out about social media, I love that it is backed with all of this concrete evidence, research, things that go along with that, because um, the last couple of years have really proven that we are not able to, on our own, filter out what's true and what's not true. <laughs> There's just, and, and you go into that, so we don't have to do that here, but you've really shown how some of the conspiracies came up. And you go through five ways that social media a social internet really shapes us. You talk about how we believe attention assigns value, how we trade our privacy for expression, how we pursue affirmation instead of truth, how we demonize people we dislike, and how we destroy the people we demonize. And I think we've seen the evidence of that. We could keep talking about that, but I really like to provide solutions. So where do we go from here? Like, what do we do with this now that we know it's a challenge? Yeah, I think really like my solution, as I said at the beginning of our discussion, my solution is never to just delete your accounts and log mm -hmm. off. Again, I will say, I think that's a fine option if you choose to do so. I just think if you're under the impression that deleting your accounts or, or even just locking yourself out of your accounts, going on a on a uh, indefinite social media fast is somehow going to untangle your life from the influence of social media, <laughs> you're sorely mistaken. I have a, I can share a brief story. So I, my grandmother's in her late eighties, I want to say like 85 or eight. 
somewhere around there. I forget. Um, she's in her late eighties. She's never used the internet ever. Um, and until very recently, I should say we have a two, my wife and I have a two year old daughter and, uh, she wanted to be able to see pictures of her, uh, beyond just when we could mail them to her. And so she got an, my dad, bless his heart, got her an iPhone and deleted every app on the phone <laughs> other than the phone app. I mean, she doesn't even text. Uh, other than the phone app and the photos app where we have a shared iCloud mm. photo album of our of our daughter because we we won't post pictures of her on the internet mm -hmm. which is a whole other discussion mm -hmm. um and and so anyway my grandmother has never used the internet never used Facebook anything like that um but we talk every Sunday afternoon Sunday evening when I'm making dinner and I'll call her and we'll we'll talk about life and all that and um she spends some time with some family members who live near her who are who are on social media and are on the internet and she regularly brings things up to me that happened on Facebook or that her <laughs> friend saw on Facebook that, that she's telling me about. And my grandmother will probably not read this book that we're talking about because I've already told her, grandma, this book isn't going to make any sense to you. Um, but she, she still consumes faith. In fact, she's, she has relayed Facebook fake news and conspiracies to me <laughs> and asked me if they're real. And so my poor grandma, who's never even used the internet, has been duped by fake news on Facebook, <laughs> which like infuriated me beyond all measure. But all of that's to say, I think we need to realize that I use this metaphor at the beginning of the book. Social media, the social internet as a whole is the water in which we swim we're, and we're fish. Fish cannot swim and cannot live outside of water. And we realistically are never going to be able to live outside of the social internet. Unless you go live in a log cabin in the woods and never talk to anyone else, you're always going to be impacted by the social internet. Even if you're just watching the evening news and they end their broadcast with a heartfelt video of a puppy swimming in this <laughs> pond or something like that. Um, you're always going to be impacted by it. So I think the best course of action, I list a handful of practical mm -hmm. things. I think we can study history. I think we can admire creation. We can value silence. There's a whole lot of practical mm -hmm. things we can do. And, and I give some some examples of what we can do to just kind of untangle ourselves. That's how I would describe mm -hmm. it. Just maybe untangle ourselves. We don't have to sever ourselves. But I think a lot of us are just so tangled up in this stuff that we we don't know how to go out on a date with our spouse and not look at our phones. We don't know how to hang out with our kids and not be scrolling Instagram while we do so. And I'm guilty of this. I don't say that this is uh, from a, from a point of view as, as someone who never does this, I'm a new parent uh, and I, I'm just learning how to do this stuff myself. And so my biggest takeaway or, or action point is just to be more intentional. Mm -hmm. That would be how I would summarize it. Like ask what's, what do I hope Instagram will accomplish in my life? Um, what's the goal of using Twitter? What am I trying to do here? Um, just asking questions like that of these platforms, I think can help us use them a little bit more intentionally and keep us from reacting to some article that just makes us mad. So we fire off some comment saying something that we would never say to someone's <laughs> face, yes. but we're just reacting in the moment and we just say it there, or we just will mindlessly scroll and purchase things on through Instagram's you know, shopping functionality. And we're just like, I never, I just spent $300 on jewelry that I, I've never spent that much on jewelry in a month. Like, how did that even happen? We just, we become consumed and we become used. And I just, the biggest takeaway I, I would say is, is just be intentional. Use the platforms. Don't let the platforms use you. That's yeah. how I would summarize it. Great advice uh, there. You talked about humility and, and that was something that really spoke to me as well, because, you know, in my pride, I don't like to admit I'm wrong. I don't like other people to point that out. And so how we respond can really demonstrate the humility of Jesus and how we interact on social media. I'm not perfect. There are moments where I, I go back and delete something I said, like I shouldn't have said Same. that. <laughs> So terms of service, the real cost of social media, where can people get that book when it comes out? By the time this airs, it will be available for sale. Sure. Um, you can go any place you buy books on the internet uh, should have it. So it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's on Christian book. It's on books a million. Um, it's on a couple other retailers, I believe. Um, 
And uh, if you have a local Christian bookstore, perhaps they perhaps they have it. I know I I, t- I actually have a friend who works at one here in my town, just outside Nashville, and and he said that they're going to order some copies. And I said that's great. How, what do I have to do to get you to order twice that many? Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you can find it anywhere you like to you like to purchase. You can actually go to I think termsofservicebook.com has uh, a, a little bit about the book if you're if you're trying to figure out if it's actually going to be interesting mm-hmm. uh, and then has a list of all the different places because I know some folks you know don't want to give Amazon more money but that I mean that's I like to read Kindle books too so mm-hmm. that's where I tend to buy a lot of my books so certainly can find it there really anywhere you buy your books you should be able to find it and what do you say to the person who's on the fence about reading it what what would you say that would be the the why behind why they should pick it mm. up? And that's a that's a great question, because, I, you know, I've I've spoken with friends recently that I think sometimes the kind of person it takes to sit in their office or their study and write a 50,000 word book and the kind of person it takes to sell a 50,000 word book, those personalities are different a lot of times. And so it's been kind of I love coming on and speaking with you or anyone else I've had the opportunity to chat with, but just, out, you know, straight out asking somebody or telling somebody to buy the book is kind of makes me uncomfortable. But here's what I would say. I devoted hundreds of hours and months of work to this book and to this topic because I think it's incredibly, incredibly important for us to engage wisely a technology is at the cent- that's at the center of so many of our lives. So if you're on the fence, what I would ask you to consider is, is it worth like two to four hours of your time to maybe read it? I would say so. I, I think it's important enough that I devoted hundreds of hours to writing it. Um, and so I would just maybe ask yourself, I spend, you know, say to yourself, maybe if you're the average person, you probably spend about two hours a day on social media. I spend about two hours a day on social media or, you know, 10 to 14 hours a week. Would I be willing to spend four to six hours, depending on your reading speed, reading a book about my relationship with this thing that I spend so much time with? I think a lot of us would be well served by, thinking more deeply about something we've given so much time to, whether that's the church, whether that's social media, whether that's our spouse and parenting or marriage or whatever else, if there's something that's so central to your life that you spend multiple hours a day with it, it's probably worth understanding. Yeah. And so I would say, if you're wondering, I don't really know if this book's for me, it may be a hard for you to read. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Um, It may be hard for you to read, uh, but life is about doing hard things. And I would say if you're maybe concerned about doing it because it might be difficult. Ask yourself, has social media made me averse to doing hard things? Do I just want to do things that are easy and comfortable? I would say that's one effect of of our relationship with social media. Yeah, I asked you to share that because I'm a picky book reader and I really liked what I've seen in the draft. And I'm somebody who doesn't like to be salesy either. And I've seen how this can influence whole families. And here's why. I don't even normally go into this much talking about a person's book, but <laughs> I, but um, it affects how I would parent. So uh, for the parents out there who feel as if they know nothing. Now, I'm a techie person, so I stay up on a lot of stuff on social media. But most of my friends who have teenage kids go, I don't know, it's just this stuff on their phone. If that's you as a parent, you need the book because it's going to help you to really understand what what your kids are doing. If you are me, who's really into technology, it's going to wake you up a little bit to say, oh, yeah, I've given it a lot more leeway in my life than I need to. So I think that's why it has a double impact. And so it's a helpful book that way. So Terms of Service, The Real Cost of Social Media. The other thing I discovered is that you, Chris, have a really helpful blog and you have a lot of things on there. So it's sort of hiding out there. And that's at termsofservice.com. What was social it? dot social? That's right. It wasn't dot com. Um, terms of service dot social articles, um, really kind of a mix of things about social media, about about current events. There was some humor and cartoons and all kinds of things. So anyway, if you're somebody who would prefer to get things to your inbox instead of messing around with social media, uh, there it's right there. It's the first thing that pops up. So I encourage listeners to go there, too. Um, Chris, do you have a word to wrap up today just to leave with our listeners? Yeah, I just, I mean, if you've made it this far, thank you for, for listening <laughs> and taking made the it time. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're still listening and you're hearing this last word, uh, just thanks. Thanks for giving me your time. I, I don't, um, 
I recognize that time is the most valuable and time and our attention, which is also a theme in the book is the most valuable asset all of us have. Uh, if you spend $500 willy nilly and you kind of regret it, you can make $500 back. You, you can figure that out. Um, you can't make your time and attention back. All of us have a kind of a set amount and we don't know how much we have, but you can't generate more of it. And uh, if you're sitting here listening in or in your car or however you're listening, I just want to thank you for giving me and, and Michelle some of your time because frankly, that's the most valuable asset you have. And, and I hope that for you, if you're listening here, you don't feel discouraged or feel um, upset or like you need to abandon your connection to friends and family around the world through these platforms. But my hope is that you maybe feel a little bit charged and a little bit energized to take back maybe a little bit of control. Uh, and when you consider how valuable your time and attention are, start to ask if you're spending that in the way that best suits you and best, best helps and serves your family. I think all of us are here um, for any number of specific reasons, but for a general reason of using the gifts God has given us to serve other people and ultimately um, to show people the kingdom of God. And I think that our relationship with social media and how we use it is central to stewarding the gifts God has given us to serve others and to serve him. And so my hope is that if you've listened to this and you've gotten this far, that you maybe feel a little bit more motivated to evaluate the role that social media plays in not only your personal life and your relationship, but the sort of commission and, and mission that you've been given as a follower of Christ. So hopefully you're not discouraged or you're not maybe too, uh, too optimistic either, but you're just kind of charged and you're, and you're ready you're ready to take matters into your own hands and maybe take a little bit of time back into your own hands too. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today and also for taking all that valuable time to write this book to provide a resource for people to navigate that social internet space a little bit better. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, it's been a joy. If you're hoping to get the book that Chris talked about and some of the other resources he shared, you'll find links to that in the show notes at michellerayburn.com slash 134. Thanks for listening and have a great week. You've been listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn. Check out tips, resources, and inspiration at michellerayburn.com to get the show notes for this episode. Each week, I share links to everything mentioned in the episode, graphics you can share, and guest quotes. I also invite you to join the Life Repurposed Facebook community for weekly conversation with others on the journey of discovering the repurposed life. Before you go, which friend needs to hear this episode? Share a link with a note to invite them to listen. <laughs>